Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the fourth in our series of seminars on the different approaches to and the applications of uh, research frameworks. My name is Paul Walsh. I'm the acting chair of the board of directors of the Discovery Programme. And as you're all aware, the Discovery Programme, we are committed to working with our partners and engaging with the wider archaeological sector to identify research gaps and coherent themes for our own future research. Today, we are privileged to speaking to us Dr. Karen Dempsey from the School of Archaeography, Archaeology and Irish Studies at NUI Galway. And Karen is currently undertaking postdoctoral research on medieval houses in Ireland from 1100 to 1600 AD, and you will be aware of her recent publication on this in Archaeology Ireland. Um, Karen is going to speak to us today about gendering the narrative of research frameworks, and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing her perspective on this. However, prior to handing over the web floor to Karen, may I remind you all that you will have the opportunity to ask questions or make comments at the end of this presentation. You can type your questions in the, into the Q&A box, which is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. But please include your name with your questions and indicate if you would like to ask the question or make the comment yourself, or if you prefer to have me read out your question or comment. And if you opt to ask the question, uh, the other attendees, as well as the speakers on screen, will be able to hear your voice, but they won't be able to see you. And finally, may I also remind you that the entire webinar, including the discussion and questions elements, will be recorded and published on our YouTube channel. So if you ask a question but don't want to be included in the recording, please be sure to notify us as soon as possible so that we can edit the video before loading it onto YouTube. So now I will hand you over to the capable presentation of Karen. Karen, fire ahead. Okay, thank you so much and thanks for the introduction and thanks to everybody who's here to listen and also delighted to have been invited to speak um, on gender and narrative of research frameworks. And I think um, when I was first asked to, to discuss gender Irish archaeology and research frameworks, I was pretty happy because I'd just come back from doing a two-year a postdoc on gender, heritage and castles. And I really thought, you know, God, this is something that Irish archaeology is really, really missing. But as soon as I started doing the prep, of course, I was like, oh God, there's so much to say. And also there's so many different audiences and stakeholders. I was just, you know, excited, but also a, a little bit daunted. And so I think that when we're thinking about research frameworks for gender in Irish archaeology, we have to think about gender as an analytical category of inquiry in Irish archaeology, but also gender as a lived experience for people working in the sector, which of course includes heritage professionals as well. But also we have to think about the audiences, especially the general public who participate in archaeological learning or various forms of engagement, as well as the heritage encounters. So, um, you know, I want, <laughs> I think I, I, I agonized over what to what to talk about exactly. And I think the three things is that um, I'm going to focus on is gender as an analytical category, gender in the profession, which is basically gender balance and gender bias, and gendered interpretation in professional practice and public practice. So now at this point, I suppose I could begin with gender bias and imbalance in archaeology. But actually, I, I think it's better to be constructive and to show how engaging with gender and feminist thinking is better for everybody in the long run. So I think I'd just ask everyone to, you know, put aside your maybe your previous understandings of what this might entail and fully engage with me today, despite the fact that we're all separate here. Um, I, I also think that uh, it's much harder to think about how we can all do gender archaeology, to use it as an analytical category um, in our research interpretations and um, research frameworks. Now, of course, I shouldn't have to point out, I suppose, that we're all gendered people and we're already putting particular perspectives into our work, even if it's not obvious. So it can become entwined with the implicit assumptions, perhaps, we make about the past. So what then about gender as an analytical category? Well, gender is not a simple male, female or man, woman binary classification. It's the performance of a socially constructed identity that intersects with age, race, class and so on. 
we are not born, but rather become gendered over time. And this means that how we walk, talk, move, act, all form parts of our own identities of being a gendered person. A gendered role, uh, sorry, by, by addressing questions to the material evidence that you can see in this slide, landscape space, architecture, food, bodies and artefacts, all the stuff that make up our worlds and the worlds in the past, we can investigate gendered roles and identities. A gender role is comprised of societal expectations. And I'm sure that everybody listening to me here has had this in their life. Oh, you should be a good girl or have your hair tied up in a ponytail or no, that's not how a man behaves or whatever, whatever it happens to be. These things are, are constructed to walk, talk, dress and act. And of course, the gender role can be more straightforward than exploring, say, a gendered identity, which is the intensely personal conception of self. It's concerned with the interior life of, of us and of people in the past. Gender too is performed differently throughout the life course, meaning that people, us, people in the past, consistently renegotiate our roles and identities throughout time. Ideally, and what I would hope for, is that gender archaeology challenges the notion that gender is timeless, biologically determined and universal. In other words, that just means that basically things change all the time and nothing is inbuilt or innate. Some studies still equate sex and gender within the same thing. They view gender as a binary, this male-female opposition. Or they implicitly assume that gendered identities follow Western or European models. And so I think we have to be really aware, especially in our world, that gender exists on a spectrum. We have to assume the presence of various identities, including trans or pan folks, as well as categories of normative men and women. We know that gender roles, gender and gender expressions have changed over time. I mean, living in our world today, we know that this is the case. Ireland 40 years ago is a completely different world, especially in terms of, of the performance of different genders. From its inception in the 1980s, gender archaeology, and I suppose I'm particularly coming at this from a feminist perspective, it drew on inspiration from the humanities, but also greater civil rights movements across the world. And it wanted to change archaeological practice. It highlighted in particular the problematic assumptions made about the past in the present, including ideas of universal male dominance. And this is in particular noticeable in the fixation on the warrior identity. And I think that while this isn't Ireland, it's a great example. So this is the, the Bika burial and it's an inhumation and it has this complex array of brave gifts and a burial practice that would have assumed that it was a male Viking warrior. But new studies in ADNA showed it as an individual was genetically female. Now, I don't believe that that suddenly makes this person a woman or anything, but it changed how the, the burial was viewed across the world. It was no longer seen as a woman, it was no longer seen as a warrior, but seen as a woman who was given honorary status. Now, of course, this person could have been genetically female, but assumed a male identity throughout their life. What it does show here is how ingrained the conflation of sex and gender roles are still, and the impossibility of a female operating as a man or wielding male power. So thankfully, you know, I'm, I'm, you should read the article, I'm being a little bit short-handed there, but it's very interesting. And I think that it encapsulates how we have to keep challenging this idea of universal male dominance, this man, the hunter, warrior. And this is what second wave feminism did in, from the 60s to the 80s, and in particular in archaeology from the 80s onwards. Women were demanding space both within contemporary society and in accounts of the past. And feminist archaeology in the 80s really began with making women visible. And that, of course, is problematic, as we see it now, of course, with hindsight. And from the 90s onwards, um, things started to change, I suppose, with the arrival of post-colonial, post-structuralist um, and post-processual archaeology. Gendered approaches moved towards conversations of difference, including explorations of power as well as agency. And it moved on from this add women and stir approach where, you know, kind of women were smeared onto narratives of the past and thinking that that was inclusivity. And this then resulted in actual difference in conversations on sexualities, the body, 
ethnicity, personhood, the life course, and so on. And there was a surge in studies of masculinities. And this had been very much left out in the study of making women visible. And of course, that's so problematic because if, if woman is seen as this homogenous whole, then so too is man, and we can't get beyond um, that, that binary distinction. And it is unfortunate, despite this work, that archaeology remains dominated by stories of anonymous, homogenous men. But I think with renewed feminist activism and, and general change, a desire for change across the world, that this and other narratives are going to, are going to change and be more inclusive. So I've given you kind of a real quick rundown as to um, what gender archaeology is there. And it's not just an archaeology of gender, it's feminist thinking in practice. In short, it's not doing bad science. So let's think of not including gender as, as, as imagining the earth is flat, okay? <laughs> Nobody wants that. I think at a, at a core element, it's about not making assumptions about the past confronting our own preconceptions, which we might otherwise unthinkingly project into the past, into our interpretations and into our analysis. And often gender archaeology can be seen as things associated with women. And I need to really be very clear on this. It is not only things associated with women. Like now, of course, gender exists on a spectrum and we have to move beyond this binary thinking. So kind of a crash course there. And so we move on to the next section of this. And this is kind of reflecting on um, gender in Irish archaeology and how Irish archaeology has approached gender in the past or how archaeology in Ireland approaches gender in general. Is there actually explicit gendered interpretations in Irish archaeological research? Well, in terms of the research frameworks to date, gender does not feature at all. Archaeology 2020 was focused on establishing institutional frameworks and overviews rather than on thematic reports. Of course, this was probably very necessary at the time. The Bruna Boigne research framework does not explicitly address questions of gender, but asks questions of people more broadly, which is inclusive of social identity, as we heard from, from Jess two weeks ago. There was a review of needs um, in Irish archaeology, which was very similar to archaeology 2020. At first it was infrastructural, but then it suggested seven research themes, out of which three were uh, selected for funding streams, and that led to the creation of INSTAR, which is the National Strategic Archaeological Framework, and we also heard about this from Ian last week. This didn't include gender either, the umbrella term of cultural identity may have been a way of trying to include different identities more broadly. Yet on closer reading, these research themes, especially the first one, are not inclusive of gender. There's a focus on conflict, a point which I'm going to return to later. You see, I can maybe unfairly, I've coloured in all the areas here where it says territories, boundaries, weaponry, physical defence, border control, and where it has said cultural identity. And you can see there's, there's quite the mismatch there. That's not to say, of course, that some of the projects funded under INSTAR did not think of gender, but I think it's probably closer to the truth to say they might refer to gender at some point in their work rather than using it as an explicit category of analysis. I think by and large, um, gender as an explicit category of analysis is absent in archaeology in Ireland, is absent from Irish archaeology and, you know, I'm pretty happy to be talking about gender more generally today, being an archaeologist in Ireland. Uh, now, happily, of course, there are exceptions to this, as there always are. Particular scholars do attend to gender in their work, as you can see on this slide here, which shows quite a wide range of um, topics and chronological um, periods and subject areas. And other archaeologists also work on gender inequality in the profession, but I'm going to return to that at the end. So I suppose I want to think about, because I think it's related, why don't we talk about gender? Is it seen as too messy, too problematic? Is it, is it too much trouble? And, and what are we missing because of this? 
Now, I did say at the start, it's super easy to criticise the fact that in the 40 years since the first gender and feminist challenges to archaeology, we have not engaged with gendered research. But I don't want to focus on that. And I think, you know, good feminist practice is to actually build rather than critique. I want to focus on how we can include gender in our research and into our research frameworks. But I do think it's necessary to disentangle the reasons behind this situation. Is it a legacy resulting from decades of studies that focused on martial functions and contexts, or an idealized elite male who reigned supreme? This, of course, specifically excludes women and other gendered identities who often seem to operate on the margin of society. To me, the accepted view in the discipline is that much of our archaeological monuments are primarily military, about, about status or highlighting patronage. Who built what, where and first? Emphasis is placed on investigations of patronage, named or otherwise, and pinpointing a primary construction phase with a corresponding date. And this is as true for medieval archaeology as it is for the prehistoric period. Now, in medieval archaeology, probably a little bit more prevalent because much is focuses on the idea that things like castles or elaborate ring forts were built for and as a result of warfare or defence. But I think even if this were true, why don't we consider the role of gender in war? What about the fluctuating, shifting gender roles of people who did battle, those who did not? It makes me think that Irish archaeology is interpretively stuck in its descriptive tradition with little engagement in social identity beyond status. And there is a fixation on status. And of course, status isn't about a status for everybody. It's a fixed point. And you've guessed it. It's on warriors or elite men. And this seems really bizarre to me, given that our studies are supposed to be about the lives of people in the past. People with all their complexities, emotions, and the senses are absent. The past is a blur of homogenous whole called people. For better to quote Ruth Tringham, who said it better, the past is populated by faceless blobs. Now, of course, look, I'm an archaeologist. I'm not opposed to discussions of patronage or anything like that. Um, they're one, but they're just one part of the story. Thinking that a, establishing an exact chronology for something tells us everything we need to know is, it can't be that way. I think we need to think about people, their social identities, inclusive of gender, and their lived experience more fully. So what about an example where I think an alternative and gendered thinking could have enriched the study? Let's think about Neolithic Ireland. Discussions of the Neolithic rarely seem to involve gender. And is this because we didn't think that that society employed gender difference? Or is it too hard to think about gender because the, the paucity of material remains? I don't think so. But if we think that gender was an important structuring principle in their society, that's fascinating. And we need to talk about that. Not just because it's interesting to understand ne ne Neolithic society, but also because of the contemporary reflection it can provide to our own incredibly hierarchical society. I think also if gender had been discussed, then perhaps it would have gone a long, long way to deconstruct the problematic assumptions being, and narratives that have been come to emerge around the God Kings and um, incest and family ties currently surrounding monumental complexes constructed in Neolithic Ireland. Why are heteronormative assumptions and patriarchal hierarchy projected onto the Neolithic without any sort of critical analysis? I have a picture of the recent ADNA studies here, and because I'm intensely critical of the, the patriarchal narrative that is embedded within this. It doesn't mention gender specifically, but there is an undercurrent of male supremacy and an implied heteronormative family unit, which I am deeply uncomfortable with. Whether intentionally or not, it reinforces ideas of sexuality, gender, and of course, family ties. The conception of the past that does not conform to a hierarchical present is beyond interpretation. I have to ask then, why is the past so straight? And I think this is also really clear when we look at another, another example. This is the Rallahan man that I recently discussed with my partner, Neil, 
and um, and other colleagues. And it's 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 very cool. It's also known as the Ralhan figure, and it's an anthropomorphic figure made of you, and it fits into a wider, if limited, tradition of similar deposits across Northwest Europe. Initially, owing to the presence of a pubic hole, which is quite visible, this object was viewed as female, but then later thought to be male. It's assumed that there was a, a now lost detachable phallus. It's currently understood more or less to act as a statement and definition of a king's new sovereignty. It's viewed as a boundary marker. But what if this figure is more complex and is intentionally gendered ambiguous? It could embody a trans identity or reference gender fluidity, but also it could signal the tensions that exist in changing gender throughout the life course, not just changing gender between genders. Equally, <laughs> I don't want to say that late Bronze Age people believed that penis make it a man, more that their ability to play with the body, shape and size, to have, if so, detachable parts, that of course they believed then in a fluidity to the human body and in whatever form gendered conceptions of people then took. But I also want to be careful not to impose a gendered attribution onto the Rallahan figure, but I do want to assert our right for discussion of its deliberate ambiguity and ambivalence in relation to gender, and maybe to say that this is a queer body. Trans people and the presence of different gendered identities is typical. Ethnographic and ethno-archaeological accounts also attest to this in the past. Why do we absent it from our stories of the past? Engaging with this deliberately ambiguous figure can tell us more about how Bronze Age people viewed possibly gendered bodies. But what it is so important to recognize is that it can open up conversations about gender in the present, which obviously are in, would include a vast range of people and people who are often absented from narratives in heritage and in archeology. span and then it shows that we're open to asking questions beyond conflict and, and territories. It also, it leads me to consider then, does the lack of gender or our lack of explicit gender influence the stories that we're able to tell about the past? So what about gendered interpretation in public practice? What's the authorized heritage discourse in Ireland? In other words, what's the dominant voice? What's the main stories that we tell about the past? And how is it gendered? For me, our authorised heritage discourse, AHD, is of militarism, as you can see, as I've, as I've mentioned a while now. And therefore, the focus on territories and boundaries and conflict in the instar topics shouldn't be surprising. It is, in fact, the status quo. Most of our stories have a military core from the idea of a group of Bronze Age warriors supplanting a Neolithic society, or the Vikings and onwards to the Anglo-Normans, the period I'm more comfortable with. And whether these things, okay, so some of these things aren't accepted, okay, so I don't think anyone believes in the Bronze Age warriors anymore, but they are starting to re-emerge. And we have to recognize that our stories seem to revolve around military events, not exactly on the events themselves, but on key figures, real and imagined. And of course, these are the big men of the past. And this is, this is particularly apparent in medieval castles. So obviously medieval castles are my area of expertise. And um, I wanted to show though, using the prehistoric examples that we can talk about gender for every period and for, for, for any sort of object. But I want to share with you in terms of um, a case study on heritage practice and heritage and gender understandings. So as, as, as Paul mentioned two years ago, I was based in the University of Reading and I was carrying out a Marie Curie Fellowship there on gender heritage in castles. And I, uh, it was called her story, but you know, I know that we know now that gender is not just, <laughs> not, not just about women, something that I had to learn throughout my time. Um, but so anyway, the, this workshop, um, involved heritage professionals from CADU, English Heritage, Historic Royal Palaces, as well as Historic Environment Scotland. Um, it also included a range of academics, people who worked in the developer-led sector, as well as independent researchers. Um, and I, I invited Irish heritage organisations, but none were able to attend. 
one of the key aims of this was trying to include challenge and change different heritage interpretations at medieval castles and try to understand interpretive approaches. Uh, the results are published in an open access paper, so anybody can access it and read it if that's what they fancy. One part of the workshop, apart from the more formal papers, was a breakout which, um, which was about what makes a good or bad gendered interpretation. Now, this was deliberately simplistic, okay? And I, people got into groups and they weren't socially engineered and they talked about what makes a good or a bad interpretation. And I find the results of this incredibly revealing. There was a notable disparity of what constituted a good and bad interpretation. And also um, there were suggestions of such things like a call for a more nuanced account, a focus on people and on lived experience, including women featured prominently. Now, some groups engaged more, um, more fully with current theoretical trends of what gender means, noting the importance of the body, the life course, cross-societal approaches, intersectionality. Um, and overall, I think, imagining um, what good interpretations looked like proved to be much more difficult than um, choosing the bad. So there were some differences of opinion and um, I'd say Sorry, I don't know how to stop that. Uh, hang on. You got it. We're back. So some, um, so there, there were really heated discussions as well around the fairness of listing gendered interpretations as bad because they were simplistic or did not capture the full extent of how we understand gendered identities in the present. They were viewed as a, as a good effort and they should be celebrated. Of course, they're reminiscent of second wave feminism, this add women and stir approach that I talked about earlier. There was consensus across the group that, that, that including women in a superficial way was a bad interpretation, despite the fact that most groups had defined good interpretations as including women. And so I think that the results of this breakout appeared to demonstrate that inserting women into traditional male narratives was still regarded, this filling in the gaps, was still regarded as a valid approach within professional heritage perspectives. Now, of course, we do acknowledge that this, and everybody does acknowledge that this is problematic, but we have to note that, that heritage organizations, academic institutions, anything that's a kind of a large scale organization, change is slow and gradual change is happening. So that is something to be, to be happier for. I think one of the, the, the really big positives that came out of my work with uh, Historic Environment Scotland was that after the workshop, they went and reviewed all their medieval castles in state care, examined their stories and challenged themselves to produce more inclusive narratives. An examination of how gender was portrayed at these castles was, was reflected on and whose stories were more prevalent and what were they actually telling people. And it did show that the named men dominated, like some, in some cases 95% um, of their stories. And so they, they commissioned me to complete the first ever gendered study um, of a castle at Kerlaverock, and it informed um, their, their new exhibition there. And I think that this is a really, really positive thing um, because they were able to reflect, notice a gap, which was what Paul said at the beginning of the, the, the thing that's what the discovery program and a research framework for Irish archaeology wants to do. Now, I will say that while I'm praising Historic Environment Scotland and their wonderful Scottish archaeological research framework, which does include gender, they did manage to say something about telling Scotland's story, which is a male figure with marauding male figures in the background. So, you know, sometimes a picture says a thousand words. So while I am praising them on the one hand, you know, there's always more, more work to do. Um, it may seem like I'm being a little bit down on heritage and um, uh, interpreting um, different stories in the past, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not. I think Heritage does a great job of being inclusive. If you see here, this is one of the a pictor, um, graffiti artist 
interpreting the story of one of the first witch trials in Ireland in the 14th century. And it's in a, in a, in a maybe a place that's not visited most and it really captures something. Um, so I think it's actually archaeologists and our narratives that need to catch up with what heritage is doing. So um, I've talked through the idea of what gender is, gender as an analytical category, and how that affects heritage interpretations and the other interpretations we do as, as archaeologists. And I'm going to just move on briefly to looking at gender bias and gender imbalance in the profession. And this is the bit, I suppose, I find and found when doing this the most, the most complicated to talk about because not exactly from a scholarly perspective, but because Ireland's small and um, everybody's doing their best and I don't want it to look like I'm being, I'm being overly critical of anything. We have to recognise that gender imbalance in archaeology still manifests in senior roles within academia and within professional practice. In 2006, Connor and Patrizia, and in 2012, Neve and Kerry, completed two large scale surveys um, in relation to archaeologists in Ireland. They showed that the profession was largely split between people who identify as men and women, and with only one example of an individual preferring not to submit to gender. But this changed at senior level. The Archaeology 2025 document says that archaeology is one of the most gender equal professions in Europe. But DISCO 2, completed by Kerry and Neve, showed that while some parts of the profession are gender balanced in terms of men and women, there is a dominance of males in permanent positions and women in fixed term positions. And in Northern Ireland, these figures are the same. So that doesn't actually really show gender balance at all. We could say that there's an overall gender balance, but that doesn't mean it's a gender equal profession in terms of opportunities and promotion. For example, look at the chair, look at the 20 pre or, sorry, the chairs of the IAA board over the past 20 years. You can see that it's quite male dominated, despite us being a gender equal uh, profession. I'm not the first person to point this out. Muriel McClatchy at the IAI in 2019 noted that, uh, that there was ongoing gender inequality in archaeology in higher education institutions. At that time, UCD had never appointed a woman as professor nor as head of school. Now, this has changed, of course, with the appointment of Joe Brook. But these imbalances are mirrored to a greater and lesser degree across different organisations. The Royal Irish Academy is balanced in terms of men and women on the archaeological committee, but it is completely male dominated. The recently appointed Dr. Mary Canning is its 50, 57th president, but she is the second female president in 235 years of the institution's history. And in the same way that I showed the position of chair on the board of the IAI has been overwhelmingly occupied by men, the JIA editorial board is much more equally split. The board of the DP, which is also male dominated, 11 to 4, and four out of the five of the last of the four out of five of the last chief archaeologists of the National Monument Service have all been men. And I know it might take a little bit of time for those figures, figures to sink in, but we need to think about if archaeology is seen as having gender equality. Why are there not more women in leadership roles as heads of boards or of organisations? Now, of course, noting the appointment of Lynn Scarf and also of Maeve Sikora, who succeeded Mary Cahill. And I'm not just promoting putting women into positions of power. Equality has to be for all. It's not just about women. We have to consider minoritised groups and those who still, especially in terms of gender equality, exist on the margins of society. You, you might hope that this bias, this imbalance, is just in um, uh, organisations, but no, that's not the case. So I recently carried out an assessment of um, gender imbalance and authorship across a range of Oxford handbooks, which are seen as the kind of go-to um, state of the art of the discipline. And the, and the authorship was overwhelmingly men, overwhelmingly white men. And taking into account, I did a broad geographical and cultural um, um, selection for the, the handbooks. And I think it was also interesting in this that power and display were not explicit themes in many of the Oxford handbooks. Gender was not. 
and the discussions therefore can only account for an assumed and projected heteronormative past. If nobody's thinking about gender, looking at different gendered identities, we're going to keep reinforcing the same old thing, the status quo. This is true closer to home as well. The NRA's Stories of Ireland Past, which is all about new knowledge gained from Irish road schemes. Out of 15 authors, there is one woman. So let's end on a good note, because in the last 20 years, the JIA fares, fares a little better. And one wonders, is that down to editorial decisions on the board? Because I did mention that that is far more equal than the others. And I suppose I want to think about, do these things actually matter? Is it that we need more diversity in authorship in order to see more diversity in the past? Well, I mean, I think the answer is clear as the light of day that yes, we do. And we need to embrace different and diverse voices because it enhances then our understandings of both the past and perspective. We need different perspectives. There is an onus, of course, on the gatekeepers, those who control access or influence archaeological discourse. And this means addressing this disparities, which, you know, by having me to talk about gender is, is definitely one way of doing it. And I still think we need to consider if the paucity of research is about anxiety, is about what is valued by the academy. Is gender not a topic for um, acceptance in the establishment? Or actually, are people not interested? I think we have a large and interested audience, especially today when gender is such a, a, such a topic of interest for everybody. So, so what do I want from gender research in archaeology in Ireland? And what do I want it to do? Well, I wanted to contribute to a debate on equality for all genders, cis, pan, trans folk, as well as everything in between. I want to create inclusive um, gendered interpretations that account for difference in the past. I want to explore the vast range of identities, gender, age, social class, difference, the body, the life course, and all of those intersections. They're, they're the powerful factors that shape everyday life. And I want to end by um, asking you to reflect on what I think we should think about before engaging with a research framework for gender. We want, need to think about who is archaeology and heritage for? Should we be aiming to speak to wider and divor more diverse audiences? In terms of public heritage and archaeology, it's still perceived as the visibility and authentic representation of women. And we definitely need to change that. Of course, by engaging with gender archaeology, these these, we, can, we can move beyond this visibility and develop new conceptual and methodological frameworks. So of course, in saying that, I know that gender doesn't equal women, and I have been saying that the whole time, but we also need to still reflect on the fact that more women are not included in, at professional level, that other gendered identities and those from minoritized groups need to be made more visible within the profession. There is scope to develop gender beyond equaling women to account for more diverse identities from queer histories to homosocial bonds. We need to be more active and reflective on what we want from gendered interpretations. So I'll end by asking you to think about some questions. Do we want to only examine the gendered identities of past people? Do we want to demonstrate the spectrum of gendered identities and roles of people in the past? Do we want to reveal the diverse range of gendered identities and roles of people in the past in order to share them with people in the present? Or finally, should we challenge visitors, students, engaged audiences to consider how the gendered identities of people presented at our heritage sites, in our academic institutions, in our research works, um, may reflect or reinforce the gendered ideologies present in the Western world today? Are we complicit in reinforcing that onto the past? The EU recognises the cross-sectoral application of cultural heritage. Archaeology, as part of this cultural heritage, has been reclassified as a strategic resource, whatever that means. But for me, I think it means that we can add so much to society. We can shape what we do now. We can share knowledge, we can create knowledge, and we can challenge existing knowledge about how we can make people make themselves and understand the world around them, both now and in the past. So I think gender has such a big role to play in this. Thank you. Aaron, thank you very much indeed for that. Absolutely fascinating insight into our 
cultural perspectives and that uh, and it was a wonderful presentation and certainly it's challenging and I note from Ruth, Dr. Ruth Johnson, Ruth said thank you very much for a fascinating and thought-provoking presentation and I certainly share those thoughts as well. Um, question and answers, will I just, just double check and see what we have here. Um, um, okay, Sharon Green um, just has a comment here. She says, speaking on behalf of Archaeology Ireland, I will put my hand up and say that the majority of articles we publish are submitted by men, but this is because men submitted more articles for consideration. As editor, I welcome and actively encourage women to submit to the magazine and would love to see articles tackling issues of gender and diversity in Irish archaeology. Thanks for an excellent presentation, Karen, and I look forward to hearing more. And I concur with that. I certainly think uh, it has been a wonderful presentation. And we would seek some more questions, if anybody has, or comments, please. Um, or has it all made us all just dumbstruck by the, uh, <laughs> the relevance of the questions that she is posing us all? Um, and to, however, you know, by way of a, a little counterpoint, when, when we look back, as you say, through the, certainly in the, as you say, membership of the Academy, that you have to record that uh, the, the gender um, presence on the, as members of the academy has been uh, rectified in we say in many in recent decades to a great extent, uh, and they were coming out of a, a, a different cultural ethos. So it, it it could skew the figures a little bit in terms of the perception. But as our perceptions are changing, um, the the points that you make to me anyway certainly are valid. Um, Muriel McClatchy has a question for you. She says. Um, thank you for your presentation. We heard last week about INSTAR research projects and during the main period of INSTAR funding 2008 to 2010, some projects decided to appoint all male research teams. Is this a problem in your opinion? And if yes, how can we tackle this? A very good question. So like, it is very hard to tackle this. And you know, I, I don't think that having, um, all male panels or all woman panels either is is um is the way forward because people bring diversity of opinions um, because of the historical male dominance in our discipline and in our who gets research funding the ability to apply for it and all the other things that can come with that i i believe in quotas and i do think that that something like that would have to be imposed upon um, future research fundings that we have to have gender diverse teams and that's not tokenism you know it's about making people consider um, why they're appointing their researchers who's the best person for the job um, and not about just maybe appointing the familiar good question a good answer thank you thank um, you Rebecca Boyd also wants to ask, she says, thanks, Karen. Do you feel that the dominant heteronormative and male stroke status stroke power focus in research agendas is a direct result of the gender balance within research departments? There's a good question now. <laughs> like, yes, I mean, and also uh, the way in which our narratives have been framed for the last years definitely comes down to who has the power and who doesn't. That is not to say either that that women in, in positions of power don't also hold those views. It's the status quo, basically. And it and that doesn't have to be gendered. So I think that in, in order to shift that narrative, we have to start embracing new ways of thinking. Um, but of course, yeah, share, sharing the sharing the power and helping other people up because good feminist practice isn't just about appointing women to powerful positions it's about helping everybody along the way you know so reaching down and pulling people up with you or sending the lift back down as as other people have said before me um jessica smith says fantastic talk karen given the unequalness of representation in the irish profession as you outlined how would you suggest going about constructing research frameworks that take gender into account Gender as an analytical category or gender in terms of balance. So, of course, as, as Muriel pointed out in 2019, the, 
there is um, an imbalance with um, senior roles for women within archaeology. And I do think um, that is something that has to be addressed first. And then in terms of gender as an analytical category, I think maybe have it as a, a research stream. So don't have uh, one of the three, so cultural, territory, boundaries, whatever, have, have gender as something that we can. Also, maybe we could have gender as an MA or as a core module in an undergraduate study or, or and see, and I know of course those things are easy to say and harder to do, but including uh, gender in our curriculum is something that could have a positive impact in that because it might change how people think more generally and also um, have um, we'd have an engaged audience and people who are learning about those things as they come through university. Excellent. Patrick Green says to thank you for a fascinating presentation, Karen. There's plenty to think about and act upon. He's from the uh, EPIC Museum. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Stephen Harrison from Glasgow. He says, maybe a, uh, another question. Do we need to start changing the way we teach gender and archaeology at the university level? And if so, how? Uh, <laughs> we need to start <laughs> teaching it first, I think. Um, you know, like our cognate disciplines of geography, history, politics, whatever, have been have had so much engagement with gender over the years. And I do think it's something that archaeology has really lagged in for some reason. Yeah, I, and, I, and honestly, like I pose the question to everybody, like, is it because we think it's too hard or is it because it seems too messy or do we not believe it exists? Do we not think archaeological evidence can be used to identify gender in the past? Um, you know, it's it's really something that's worth worth thinking about. And I think we should include it in our research. And even just to say, well, this is the reason why we need to. I think all of our research needs to be more theoretically explicit. And that is inclusive of gender, not just of um, not just saying, you know, this is where I'm coming from. We have to say who we are and how we came to our ideas, our, our own standpoint, our, our, almost our political views in a sense. And Ronan Swan from TII, uh, he said, really excellent lecture. Do, uh, we, we will have to do better with the next iteration of stories of Ireland's past. Uh, do you see any positive signs of changes in the practice of archaeology on the ground? Um, you know, I, the, so that's kind of a tricky question because obviously I know, um, I worked for the developer led sector for a year. I had a, had a good experience in terms of, um, my gender not being a problem, but I was based in the office. Um, I do know from other colleagues, if this is, if this is where the, what the question is, is it? Is, is wondering. Um, I'm not sure they experience gender bias on site, but perhaps things that are unique to particular genders maybe aren't considered enough. And um, even just size of PPE, like um, Caroline Criado Perez is um, an author and she's written about how science is biased against women and that and of course, I don't want to focus just on women, but I'm thinking about size difference for one. Um, that, that now as a six foot woman, this doesn't affect me, but you know, that's not the case for everybody. You know, that sort of thing really does affect people's work experience on the ground. Not having the appropriately sized gear is one thing. I don't know about, I don't know about uh, gender bias on site. Um, I think maybe another survey could, um, maybe answer those questions better than I could, but I do know from looking at the two DISCO reports that fixed term positions are overwhelmingly for women. And now, of course, that the archaeological employment landscape has changed over um, the course of the last 10 years, but it would be good to see who's permanently employed and who's not, and who's more in, in occupying those precarious positions if, if it is gendered. Uh, Jessica Smith has a follow on from her previous question. In relation to category, um, she's except the analytical category in particular, she said, who would be the authors of these frameworks? Um. I'm, I'm not really putting myself forward for this role or anything, but um, I mean, 
for the Archaeology 2025 ORIA research framework, there was huge effort put into that with lots of different committees and different different stakeholders and engagements. I'm sure that, that Jessica, the way when, when you were involved in writing the research framework, you engaged with so many people. And I think maybe it would be have to be, have been embedded from the start of that research framework. So like, I don't see gender as being a separate research framework. I see it being better as being more fully included into Archaeology 2025 or, or whatever whatever it is, the research agendas for 2030 for the for you. Um, I suppose maybe this, me giving this talk and, and considering the research framework is a little bit um, after the fact, because I don't know if Archaeology 2025 is finalized or or what, but it would have been, it's, it'd be better to be included um, within, because one of the one of the other problems with, um, initially with gender archaeology and its establishment was that People, there was a kind of a debate about whether it was going to be um, pushed to the side and always within its own particular strand and therefore not embedded within uh, research or research frameworks or whatever more generally. So I would advocate not for it to be separate, but for it to be re-included even retrospectively. Um, Stephen Harrison's come back again, just in relation to the uh, question that he asked, uh, he said, do you, within universities, do you think it needs to be taught as a separate topic or incorporated within existing courses? It's good, you know. Um, I think maybe both, like, so we can't teach archaeological theory without teaching gender. We can't teach, so first of all, it's already in there, okay? It's already in there, but it's just not explicit. We can't teach The world of the Vikings or the medieval world or the pre people without including gender? Do we need to be maybe more upfront and explicitly mention it and talk about gender roles and identities and how we can understand that through the material remains in each thing that we do? Yeah, probably. I mean, if we were to get all the curriculum together and have a look at how often power and status and patronage are discussed, probably without theoretical um, underpinnings, you know, that that could be something that we could we could we could think about and reflect on ourselves in each of our own courses that, that we teach. I do, like, I mean, I have a fantasy about, you know, having, oh, when I get an academic job to, you know, establish the first uh, gender MA or whatever, but, you know, these things take time and money and, and whatever. Um, so that's the long, the long term dream. But I think at the moment I would advocate for everybody trying to include it a little bit um, from from their very beginning, from foundational courses. Okay, um, Tracy Collins just wants to pass on her congratulations on a seminal paper for Irish archaeology. Hopefully, to be the first of many. And Catherine Bromha wants to ask you. She says thanks for or she said thanks for such a great paper and thank you for affirming the gender fluidity and gender spectrum. One part of my research is comparing historical sources with archaeological finds, such as comparing texts about women, or perhaps the lack of women, with remains of people who have been sexed as female. Most, if not all, past research on this for the early medieval period, excluding the Vikings, will assume a gender binary. However, as someone who wants to acknowledge gender fluidity, is it problematic to compare historical and archaeological sources in this way? It's a good, very good question. I suppose, you know, like we have to look at the, so if you're asking me, can we combine the archaeological evidence with historical evidence to create more full gendered identities? Then yes, I think we can, but we always have to be cognizant of who's writing the material record, who's creating that. Who is it for? Who was the audience it was meant to be for? Before we combine it with the, the, the material remains, say. Because of course, everything, even the historical record is material culture in one way or another. Now, you know, uh, I'm sure historians would be angry at me saying that, but you know, it's a historical artifact. Um, yeah, we have to be careful because certain things are written out of the past in that way. And that's why archeology span has has such a richness because material culture makes up the world of the past and in that is embedded and encoded with ideas and regulations and 
ways of living that, that can tell us about the full lives of people. Graeme Warren wants to thank you. Fantastic. In one of your slides, you made a link between gender archaeology and open access. Could you expand on this? And bearing in mind, I have a couple of more questions and things, so just we must uh, constrain, okay. <laughs> constrain ourselves a little bit. Sorry, okay. Um, oh, no, no, what you're saying is brilliant. This is great. Uh, so good feminist practice is about open data, open access to knowledge, knowledge sharing across the, the wider world. And so I firmly believe in open access research, open access policies. Um, of course, sometimes that's hampered by a paywall, but I think it's really good feminist practice for that to happen. And I do think uh, the TII have been amazing with the, 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 the National Depository for well, the DRI, basically. I think that it's such a wonderful resource. Everybody has access to it. It democratizes knowledge because feminism is about equality for all. And so having open access data is much more equal. Uh, Teresa Bulger wants to ask, after 20 years in commercial practice, it's still not unusual to find myself the only woman at a project meeting or on a construction site. That is for, like, for monitoring, obviously not excavation. And the 50 50 is representation in design project teams is still pretty rare. That's her comment on it, and I'm sure you'd agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Susan Johnson says, it is interesting that the female led projects that I'm familiar with are either community or student focused, like our field school at Dunalina or the Black Friary project led by Finola O'Carroll. Do you think women, uh, quote unquote, do archaeology, quote, differently? I, oh, thanks so much for uh, that question. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. I don't think anything is particular to women. I think that their gender role has been shaped over time. I also think that um, these sorts of things, this community work or community archaeology is often something that can be worked around other things. And so because of people being in fixed term positions or more women being in precarious positions, that they can have this greater flexibility. Um, often there is a greater emphasis on pedagogy, so this engagement with uh, schools or whatever. And again, that, that kind of comes down to the ways in which we become gendered people and or the opportunities that are given to us. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't equate that with being a woman, um, as a sort of kind of innate thing, but I do think that there is a correlation as to how um, um, we, we are, are sort of schooled in the sort of things that we do. Um, Maureen Doyle, we have some comments. Ian, Ian Doyle just wants to say thank you so much for a very stimulating presentation. Stephen Harrison from uh, Glasgow, unfortunately, said has to go. Thank you for a fantastic paper. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I think this would probably be um, approaching uh, our last question, given the time. I'm just again, Dolores Kearney says thanks to you, Karen. Absolutely superb. But finally, uh, Maureen Doyle says, please thank Karen for a fascinating and thought-provoking presentation. Lots to mull over, I completely agree. Could you ask her for me, does she think more attention should be given to gender in the funding of research? Is there still a sense that it's something largely given lip service when applications are being assessed? And of course, who's doing the assessing? <laughs> They're all really good points. And uh, yes, I do think so. And I think and um, when Muriel was doing the analysis of funded projects that she did note that there were um, there was a male dominance there. And of course, it does matter who's doing the peer reviewing and what their values are. And if it's blind as well, like peer review has to be blind and um, because biases like that are inherent and it's well established. I'm not the only person to say that. And um, in, in terms of the other thing, is it gender balance or gender uh, gender as content because you know you can't force people to do research that they're not interested in and if someone isn't genuinely interested in in gender as an analytical category and framing their project around that that is fine as long as they're they're cognizant that gender exists and may shape how they do the research but also in their research results okay folks i think we're going to have to leave it at that we have reached the end of our time for today I uh, just want to remind you that we'll be on the same channel here next week at uh, one o'clock, whereas you will, um, excuse me, here, Ronan Swan is going to join us and he's going to speak, speak about us on Transport Infrastructure Ireland Policy on Archaeology. 
the process and the relevance of a research framework. Look forward to hearing that and hope you'll join us all again there and look at goodbye. And thank you again, Karen, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation and very thought provoking for us all.